Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Royal Highness. It's my pleasure to speak to you briefly this morning, we're under a little bit of time pressure, about the history of gem fields inside of Zambia and also our hopes and dreams for the sector. Our story began five years ago, six years ago, when I first came to Zambia, and we believed that there was a very significant industry and a vision that could be built not only for colored gemstones internationally, but specifically out of the Zambian emerald sector. We have in the last five years, with a lot of hard work, approximately $200 million of capital, and of course a little bit of luck, demonstrated that the belief in that vision is sound. But the most important thing I want to tell you this morning is, it is just the beginning. And if we continue to collaborate together and work together and build the industry freely, there is a really serious industry that can be built here. My colleagues, Mr. Petsch and Mr. Jean-Claude Michelou, who are far greater experts in the colored gemstone business than I am, may not agree with me in terms of what I'm about to say. <coughs> the diamond business, which is a wonderful business and has been with us for 100 years and always will be, is a monster compared to the colored gemstone business. But there is absolutely no reason why the colored gemstone business cannot grow to start competing in size with the, diamond, with, with the diamond business. And I'm getting nodding heads from my two expert colleagues here. <laughs> now that sounds absolutely crazy given the relative size of diamonds versus colored gemstones today. There is only one key ingredient that will make that happen. And that is reliable, stable, secure supply. And it has to be done transparently so that the consumer comes to believe in the underlying product. With that, let's have a look at some slides. <coughs> Quick version of who Gemfields is. I hear all sorts of interesting rumors about who the monster Gemfields is and who it's owned by. The ownership ranges from it's owned by Israelis, it's owned by Indians, it's owned by me, all sorts of unusual stories going around. The fact is that Gemfields has thousands and thousands of shareholders. It is a publicly listed company on the AIM market of the London Stock Exchange. It does have one sizable shareholder, Pallinghurst Resources, which owns 49%, but Pallinghurst Resources itself is a listed company and it has thousands of shareholders and it owns 49% of Gemfields. The other 51% over here, probably hundreds of shareholders, directly holding shares in Gemfields PLC. Any person sitting in this room can therefore become a shareholder in Gemfields PLC. Yesterday we had the good fortune of hearing from the chairman of Cardium, Mr. William B. Nierunda, about all the good news. We're paying taxes for the first time. We paid $9 million in corporation tax last year, $4 million of royalties. Our production is up, our figures are up, and you saw some of these happy graphs. But you should not leave here today thinking that emerald mining is easy. No. It's not a joke, and I'm going to help explain some of the reasons why. Here is one of the key problems. If you mine gold, coal, copper, platinum, the grades are relatively consistent. You move a certain amount of rock, you get your commodity, and you go and sell it. The real bugbear with the emerald business is the volatility in the carrots coming out of the rock. And you can see here, just make sure I've got the pointer right, whoops, there we go. Thank you very much. You're a star, thank you. You can see the volatility of the production. You go through fat times and you go through very, very lean times. There isn't a geologist on the face of planet Earth, I believe, that can tell you exactly where you're going to get good production or bad production. And therefore you have to have a great amount of capital in order to see you through the lean times. Emerald geology 
in 30 seconds. Many of you will understand this, but for those of you that don't, it takes two things to bake an emerald cake. Number one, you need something called talc tremolite magnetite schist. TMS is a little easier. It's basically a big belt. That's the one component you need. TMS contains no emeralds. The second thing you need is a lightning bolt, shown here in yellow. That's called a pegmatite. It shows up as white streaks in the ground in Lufanyama district. Where the lightning bolt, which contains no emeralds, passes through the TMS belt, you get a reaction zone. And it's in this reaction zone that you sometimes find emeralds. <coughs> the emeralds, if you find them, may be great and they may be bad. And I reiterate, there is no geologist walking the face of planet Earth that can tell you whether that pocket's going to be good, bad or ugly. Mining is generally about scale. The only way that you can see yourself through the lean times is to move a lot of rock. We believe that Kajum today is the single largest colored gemstone mine in the world. Mr. C.B. Suresh, our director of operations here, and his team of 650 people at Kajum work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, moving rock. It's not a particularly complicated way of mining, but it's a very high risk way of mining. Kajum at the moment moves almost 1 million tons of rock every month. That is equivalent to about 23 Toyota Hiluxes every minute of every day, seven days a week, 31 days a month. It's a remarkable rock moving operation. What does it cost to run Kajum? These are our cash operating costs. You can see that in the last four or five or six months, we've been spending 3.2 million US dollars every month running this operation. It's not cheap. In return for that, what do you get? A lot of people believe that if, you, if you're the owner of an emerald license, you're automatically a billionaire. It's Lamborghinis and holidays overseas. It just isn't the case. This is the number of carats that we get for every ton of rock that we move. So we move a million tons a month, approximately, and we get, on average, three carats of emerald and beryl per ton of rock. That's the average during the last 12 months. That is less than one part per million for emerald and beryl. Generally, beryl is about 80% of your production, and emerald is about 20%. So if you exclude the beryl, you are getting less than one part in five million. So for every five million grams of rock you move, you might get one gram of emerald. It's much worse than looking for a needle in a haystack. You then have to market, market, market. You saw some of the images that Mr. Nirinda showed you yesterday. These are a few more of the various advertising campaigns that we have run. The various magazines, trade publications, models that we've brought to Zambia to get involved in the project and to take the message abroad. And if you're lucky and everything goes well, you end up with this sort of thing. This is the Fabergé Romanoff necklace. It retails for $2.85 million. It features Zambian emeralds. I love it, but I also hate it. The reason I hate it is because it perpetuates one of the most common myths in the emerald business, which is that all emeralds are created equal, i.e. they're all the same, and that they are all worth a fortune. The automatic assumption is when you say an emerald, it costs a fortune. That's just not true. And here's why. Your production coming out of a mine, and these are the figures from Kajum, looks like a pyramid. The weight increases as we go down this triangle. As the weight increases, the quality of the emeralds deteriorates very dramatically and the production weight and volume increases very dramatically. What do emeralds cost in the rough state? There's no answer to that question. But that we, what we can tell you is that they start at two cents per gram for the very lowest quality, approximately, and they run up at the very, very, very top end to approximately $10,000 per gram. That's a price range for a product. 
That means the price goes up from the bottom to the top half a million times, 500,000 times variation in prices. And everybody automatically assumes everything's worth $10,000 a gram. But it's only a tiny amount of the weight at the top that comprises the bulk of your value. And at Cardrum, 70% of our revenue comes from just 10% of the weight. So it actually means you can throw away 90% of your production and be perfectly okay. It's that top 10% that matters. And where in this triangle do you think the bulk of the theft takes place? I shan't answer that question. At the end of the day, when all of this thing balances out, at, at, at Cardrum, we get approximately $3.50 per carat. So we're not up here at $10,000 a gram, we're not at two cents per gram, we're somewhere down here on average because of the weight of this low grade material. So $3.50 per carat or about $17.50 per gram is what Cardrum averages out. A quick sanity check, we produce about 20 million carats a year, in a good year maybe a little bit more, and if you take the 20 million carats and you multiply it by the $3.50 per carat, we should be getting about $70 million of revenue every year at Cardrum. Can we try the focus on the projector? It seems to be just a little bit out. Um, you, what, what the photograph is supposed to show you is, I hope you can read the words in red here, it's labeled idiot. And it's, it's labeled idiot, ma'am, idiot. And there's an arrow pointing to a gentleman in the middle of the photograph. That gentleman is me. Like many, I had heard everybody say that cutting and polishing is the way to add value. And you add value to your product. So we as Gemfields, my bright idea, based on everything that I'd heard, I made the decision, Gemfields should be involved in cutting and polishing. We chose to do that in India, because as Mr. Rathall explained, the labor costs are a fraction of the labor costs in most other countries. And that's why India has a strategic advantage. So this photograph shows me in August 2008, going to inaugurate with our team the Gemfields Cutting and Polishing Facility. It opened in 2008. We closed it less than 12 months later. Why? Number one, the margins were nothing like what we expected. Number two, the client universe that you then have to sell to is dramatically different. It's a very different customer base. And whereas with the rough, we only sell to 30 or 40 companies, with the polished, you suddenly have to sell to hundreds or thousands of companies. Worse, when you sell rough, you get cash. Normally, when you sell the polished, you don't get paid. They take the gemstones on consignment. They pay you six months later. When you ring them in six months' time and you go, Hi, it's Sean from Gemfields. Uh, could you send your cash? Can I have another three months, please? <laughs> and that's why we shut this facility down. So I stand before you today, having had the bright idea, I was the idiot. We learned the lesson about cutting and polishing the hard way. We came back to focus only on the rough, and I think our results speak for themselves. What we should have done is studied the problem sooner before we went off and opened this facility. These are some figures from the diamond sector. When you look at the diamond sector, um, this is a study done by a consulting firm called Bain. And they've broken down the various activities in diamond mining. And they show us here their estimates of the margins, the profit margins, for the various roles in the sector. The two big ones are production, 22 to 26 percent. And the next biggest one is retail, 5 to 10 percent. And therefore, when you, speak, when you hear Gemfield speak of the mine and the market, rather than mine to market, but the mine and the market, those are the two areas that we are looking at. Cutting and polishing, the margins are 2 to 5 percent. It's a low margin game. But as you heard yesterday from my colleague Jackson, it's much better to add value locally by cleaning your product properly, which takes the risk out of it. The buyer can see what's inside. When he feels more confident, he gives you a higher price, and by grading and sorting it properly. <coughs> this is an article from Forbes magazine, August last year. 
Diamond prices were not doing so well, but emerald prices were doing very nicely. A happy situation. Our international auctions, which are always attended by members of the government and also by the board appointed director from government on the Cardium board, have delivered very successful results. They have transformed the industry and I believe any one of our participating clients would attest to that fact. You saw some of the graphs yesterday. This again shows a combination of the higher grade auctions and the lower grade auctions. They work. We repatriate the funds from these auctions directly to the bank accounts of Cardium Mining Limited in Zambia. So I have to ask a question. Why seek to stop a method of international auctions that is clearly delivering the goods and in respect of which the funds are repatriated and we publish all the auction results? That is the question. The answer, I have no idea. One of the reasons might be the frequently heard allegation that somehow Jim Fields hoards billions of dollars overseas. We mine here and then we go and make all the money offshore. What a load of nonsense. And it's easily verified because Jim Fields is a public company. It's subject to the regulatory arrangements of the London Stock Exchange. Its accounts are audited. So let me walk you through the math very briefly. Cardium's total revenues for the year ending the 30th of June last year were 78 million US dollars. By comparison, Gemfield's PLC had published revenues for the same year of 84 million. So where are the missing billions? The gap between Gemfield's revenues and Cardium's revenues <coughs> is only six million dollars. So that's the maximum extent of Gemfield's somehow potentially making additional profits overseas. But remember that Gemfield's owns other businesses. Therefore it has other income, it has other revenues. And that's what explains the supposedly missing six million. For example, a 50% stake in the Kariba Amethyst mine. We sometimes assist our downstream clients with selling some of their polished gems and we earn some commissions from that. And we also sometimes buy rough in other markets like Brazil and also on occasion in Jaipur. So where are these missing billions? And who's suggesting that we're hiding the money offshore? Again, the answer, I have no idea. Transparency is the key to this industry and to its development. And I was delighted to hear some of the presentations yesterday, not only from the ZRA, but also in relation to EITI. And we would appeal to government, because we welcome the transparency in the publishing of the data, to make available for us this information, not only for Cardium, but for everybody, all government departments, all of the producers, so that everybody can see what's going on. One of my favorite adages is, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. We have to have the information in order to be able to make the right decisions. And I was delighted yesterday in the ZRA presentation that these figures were made available to us, the mineral royalty collections in respect of emerald and beryl. But we would request government also to publish the total corporation tax paid by emerald producers and the total weight of declared Zambian emerald and beryl exports. It's only three data types. But in that way, we will be able to see the implied value of all emerald and beryl exports. And most specifically, we'll be able to see the average dollar per carat price or quatra per gram price of the exported emeralds. And remember, I've given you a benchmark. At Cardium, on average, we get about $3.50 per carat. And I wonder what the figure is for the industry overall. That data must be there, and in order for us to better build the industry, we all need to see that information. So, the principal keys to the success of the industry are transparency. Zambia has to be, above all else, 
a consistent, reliable and secure supply. Remember that we're the little guy in the industry as Zambia. We're number three behind Colombia and Brazil. There are other sources of supply. We have to be competitive in order to be able to take market share from the other countries. International marketing and reputation building is absolutely critical and there's a lot of discussion yesterday about what Big Brother can do for the rest of the industry. I believe it's fair to say, ladies and gentlemen, that Cardroom and Gemfields have been spending a great deal of money on international marketing which benefits not only themselves but obviously the industry as a greater whole. And finally, one of the reasons that Gemfields decided to sponsor this summit is because it's very important to get all the issues on the table. Communication and collaboration is going to play a critical role for us going forward. Some quick observations. Every day in the newspapers we see articles about people being caught for tax fraud, about different governments working together, sharing bank account information. There is a global trend towards greater transparency. Accept it and embrace it. We believe that is the way forward. Secondly, Gemfields and Cardrum have enjoyed a really successful working relationship with government during the last six years. I believe that Cardrum is an international model of successful collaboration between a government and a private investor. We have shown the way in every respect. And therefore we welcome government scrutiny and monitoring of the sector and we're very pleased that it's getting the attention that it so rightly deserves. Reiterating the point that Zambia is number three in the world, when there are wobbles in Zambia, as Mr. Rathall pointed out, it makes not only investors but also the Emerald customers nervous. Their number one concern is they want to know the supply is secure and it's not going to be subject to bumps in the road. I was pleased yesterday to hear that there was some encouragement for some of the small scale producers potentially to merge their operations and or their licenses. The reason for that is that generally speaking, mining works better when it's done on a scale. I've already made the point about local value addition, but that should be pursued by appropriate cleaning of the product and the grading and the sorting. It will be much more successful than cutting and polishing as I've learned from bitter personal experience. The, the point about clamping down on legal dealers and traders has already been made. They do destroy our prices and that's something which affects the industry as a whole. One possibility that's presently being looked at by Gemfields as a public company is whether or not we should list on the Lusaka Stock Exchange. Meaning that anybody in Zambia has a slightly easier route to buying shares in Gemfields and therefore to taking a stake in the Zambian emerald sector that is under the Gemfields umbrella. Finally, at the moment the role of looking at the emerald sector is split across many government departments. The Ministry of Finance um, has some involvement and interest in following the figures. The Zambian Revenue Authority yesterday, as we saw, does some of that. EITI, I think, have a team embedded inside of the Ministry of Mines. And we think one possibility for government to consider would be the creation of a dedicated Emerald Task Force. Perhaps three or four or five people who are charged with monitoring all the operations, all the exports, all the figures, and very importantly, publishing them and making them available to the public so that everybody understands what the business is all about. That aids transparency and we see absolutely no reason why that information shouldn't be published. Are my colleagues from ESMAS here this morning? Oh, here we go. Front row. Very good. Uh, I mentioned to you yesterday evening that after the discussion yesterday, insofar as requests are concerned of how Big Brother can assist. And one of the most significant complaints that we've heard during the course of the last day and a half, which is how do regular miners in the informal sector get access to fair prices for their production. So here is a proposal made in public which we are willing to move forward on the assumption that we can get the necessary sign-offs from government and any other bodies involved. The concept would be that we create in Kitwe an emerald cooperative, an emerald buying cooperative or an exchange if you prefer, 
which is not owned in any way, shape, or form by Gemfields or Cardium, but rather is owned by ESMAS and perhaps a few other interested parties that bring something to the table, where any seller of rough emeralds can bring their rough emeralds to that facility on an anonymous basis without their data being tracked and recorded because otherwise the concept will not work. And we then have registered members whose names and details are tracked. Gemfields PLC would certainly be pleased to be one of those buying members. Incidentally, it cannot be Cardium Mining Limited because under prevailing Zambian law, Cardium Mining Limited is prohibited from buying emeralds. It may only sell, it may not buy emeralds. And therefore Gemfields PLC would potentially have to become that buying member. But there would be other buying members, shown here as buying member number two and buying member number three. <coughs> so the concept is that we have an open, voluntary, multi-party buying platform to give fair prices to anybody. They don't have to sell, they can choose to sell, they can come get a quote for the emerald. If they like it, they sell. If they don't, they walk. In that way, we would also have proper recording only of the buying members' purchases, which means that we can track the export and ZRA related figures properly and accurately. <coughs> I'm telling you here today, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Royal Highness, that Cardium and Gemfields would be pleased to identify and fund the setup of a suitable location as part of our CSR projects. We imagine that this co-op or exchange would earn a commission on all the transactions in order to fund its own operations. But we realize that it takes time to get to that point. And therefore, uh, if requested or if required, Cardium and or Gemfields would be pleased to provide training and skills transfer during the course of the first year in the operation and running of the cooperative and or the exchange. And in addition to that, we would be pleased to deal with the operating costs for a maximum of one year and or shorter if the exchange or the cooperative gets to a point where it's standing on its own two feet. In closing, five or six years ago when we first came to Zambia, we made a pledge, I made a pledge personally, to be a different kind of investor, to do it properly and to do it correctly. We stand by that pledge and we look forward very much to working with all of the participants in the industry to building what is potentially one of the most exciting businesses within Zambia. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Voilà.